cybersecurity agenda setting for the next NDAA. And we have an excellent group of panelists. Um, first of all, this, this event is co-sponsored by the Art Street Institute, where I am a senior fellow in national security. And the National Security Institute at George Mason University at the law school, um, which was founded by one of our fellow panelists. Both of these institutes have a mission of finding real world solutions to, to pressing national security problems from a legal perspective, from a policy perspective as a whole. So we're really excited to have you here today. I'm going to introduce my panelists before we get into the meat of the issue. It's a rather impressive group of people. To my left is Juan Kitchen. He is currently a senior fellow at the Heritage Institute, and he's taking the lead on Heritage or at Heritage Foundation, and he's taking the lead on national security, technology, and cyber. He is formerly a national security advisor to Senator Ben Sass, where he worked on the NDAA. And he served in the US intelligence community for 15 years. And he is also the founder of Kraken Works Strategies, a tech and national security consulting company. Uh, Tara uh, Swaminatha is a partner at Spire Patent Boggs in data privacy and cybersecurity practices. And she advises on cybersecurity liability risk assessment, internal compliance, and incident response. She was formerly at DOJ, where she directed technical forensic investigations for law enforcement agencies, and is, was previously an information security administer, administrator for the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank Group, where she built networks and conducted application security risk, for, uh, risk assessments. Um, next is Jamil Jaffer. He is the founder of the National Security Institute at GMU and an adjunct professor in law. He formerly clerked to Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch and is currently a vice president for strategy and business development at IronNet Cybersecurity. He was also chief counsel and senior advisor to SFRC and senior counsel to the House Intel Committee and worked as an associate counsel to the president during the Bush administration. And, oh, we're here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. So Fessy, you get when you fly in from California yes. this morning. <laughs> Dr. Fessy Cooper is the executive director of the Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. She was previously at the Department of Homeland Security, where she served as an attorney advisor to the deputy general counsel. Uh, and the policy counsel for the Office of Policy. And she worked for a decade in Homeland Security Consulting, managing projects for the Atlantic Philanthropies, uh, the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit in London, the World Bank, and other think tanks. So basically, very smart people here to talk to you about the NDAA. And so our panel of cybersecurity experts is going to be discussing what they think the Department of Defense um, needs in this next uh, DOD process, whether it has the tools, infrastructure, and workforce to effectively compete and compete with competitors in cyberspace. They'll discuss what, if any, steps Congress should be taking to support the DOD's efforts to bolster our cybersecurity and cyber capabilities. So I'm going to be turning to each of them for three to five minutes to just give an overview of what they each think is most necessary in this next round. Ideas for amendments, big picture issues that aren't being addressed smartly, concerns about overlapping issues with DHS. Um, I will be enforcing the five minute max, <laughs> but I'm really excited to hear all of your thoughts on what, what more the US could be doing and why this is so necessary. So, I'm just going to go down the line, so start starting with Kwan. Uh, go for it. Hi, good morning. Uh, having been in your seats, um, I thought I would take a very practical approach, so I'm going to give two ideas that I think are pretty important, one tactical and one what I call strategic, and uh, you can play with them and, and see what you think. Uh, at the tactical level, uh, we have a real problem in the sense that we lack the necessary authorizations for tactical cyber operations in support of local missions with temporary effects inside of conflict zones. And I want to reiterate that. Local temporary effects 
in conflict zones. Uh, so for example, let's say we have a deployed uh, ODA team somewhere in Niger, and we're talking about white soft, not some of the national level teams, um, and they've been tasked with securing a weapons facility. And let's say that weapons facility is secured with a closed circuit uh, security system. So compromising or, or temporarily incapacitating that security system is a missing essential capability in terms of force protection and mission accomplishment. Um, but currently, the rules require that that ODA team at the tactical level rely on national level capabilities, whether it be the CIA or the NSA or other national level capabilities, to conduct cyber operations against that security infrastructure. Uh, the problem is that those capabilities are in high demand and often higher priority to prevent the utilization of that capability. Which is the net result of that is that the ODA team, who still has the mission, now has to assume a uh, greater risk profile, both to mission accomplishment and to personnel, uh, to accomplish the mission. And the thing that makes this truly terrible is that the technical capability to actually affect that activity exists at the tactical level or the t side level. And so that's a problem, uh, because these missions aren't going away, they're, they're kind of core special operations mission components, uh, and it's, a, uh, it's an authorities issue that I think can be worked out. And so at the tactical level, I think the FY19 NDAA could expand and clarify authorities to enable, uh, at the TSOC level and below, um, offensive temporary local in uh, war zones or in conflict zones, uh, offensive cyber operations. So I can talk a lot more about that, but that's a very practical example. At the strategic level, much, much more briefly, uh, the DOD must uh, dramatically increase the cyber resilience of our key strike systems, both cyber, nuclear, and non-nuclear systems, as well as their supporting critical infrastructure capabilities. Um, this must be done uh, particularly because the reality is uh, when we look at adversaries like Russia and China, uh, the likelihood that we are going to be able to prevent, if they chose to, to do this, a catastrophic attack on uh, the supporting infrastructure and strike capabilities is minimal. We're, we're at real risk in, in the near midterm. And so what we need to do is we need to build out, build out resilience, uh, cyber resilience particularly, to ensure second strike capability. Uh, it's not a fun topic, it's a little bit of a scary topic, but it's a very pressing real topic and something I'm happy to talk about more. Thank you. Uh, so and real quick, unfortunately our microphone did not show up today, so if everyone can project as much as possible. <laughs> Happy to do that over the chips that you're eating. <laughs> <laughs> um, Megan, thanks for having me here as well. Um, my practice does not go anywhere near the battlefield. <laughs> but um, what I see from a real world perspective is issues with workforce, supply chain, and generally securing data that will be um, data systems or operations that are used by the military or the defense department through uh, government contract vendors. So, for example, um, the Kaspersky Labs is an easy example of how does that happen? How does that make it through the supply chain into pervasive use across government and DOD systems? Um, that's a, a, a somewhat Yes. That's insane. <laughs> insane. Thank you. <laughs> that was the word I was trying to replace with something a little more creative. But, but at any rate, you know, avoiding things like that is critical. And the way that can be done is in the supply chain. So, for example, you know, we have I work with companies who provide satellite communications hardware that is used for DoD and foreign military. And the companies that I happen to work with have very rigorous protocols in place both internally in their own internal operations and with their products and systems and flowing on to their customers that allow their systems to be very secure. But there are many, many more that are not, that don't have the level of rigor that's necessary in creating products and services that should be used by the government, whether it's for use with troops and deployed services or at home as defensive and offensive capabilities can be used in uh, cyber warfare defense and, and tactical operations. So uh, that ties directly into the workforce issue. Um, and I'm going to approach this potentially from a different perspective as Betsy would, but when I think about the workforce, I think about the fact that humans who are working in these 
supply chain companies and in the government and the defense department need to be highly, highly educated <coughs> on security as a day to day topic. Sort of a, a somewhat pedestrian analogy that I hear all the time, which is that the weakest link in most cybersecurity programs in organizations is between the computer and the shaker. Right, so it is the individual sitting at the computer. If it can happen to all of us, even the most vigilant of us can fall for mistakes. I think the, the DOD defended against something like uh, 13 billion malicious emails a year. Now, maybe 12 billion of them were completely innocuous and easily um, siphoned off, but then that still leaves a billion that need to be seriously examined, all of which are something that an individual can fall victim to that can create large problems. So I think in terms of the cyber workforce, it's not just building um, platforms for highly skilled workers to be able to run these operations, but recognizing that every single person from the security guard to the front desk on through the people who are actually developing code and managing programs need to be highly sophisticated in both threat awareness and understand what's going on on a daily, uh, monthly basis, I believe. And with respect to the companies themselves, you know, there are Obviously, under the National Institutes for Standards and Technology Standards, there are stringent requirements for building secure products and services. But they are, and more and more, the DFARS clauses and um, 800-171, where the NIST standards are now, have now gone into force as of December 31st of last year. So a lot of contractors who build products and systems for the government now have higher standards they need to comply with. But it's similar to thinking about removing Kaspersky software from everywhere across the government. It takes a very long time for a program to actually become secure if it's not from the beginning. So something that the government can do in reauthorization and in budget appropriations is ensure that, that the DFARS requirements are in fact enforced and that they're enforced in such a way as to promote better practices as opposed to simply issuing consequences. Consequences are certainly important, but what I see happening with companies that build secure technologies is they notice an incident happens, such as there's an Iranian actor whose IP address they've seen monkeying around in their systems and has escalated access within. Then they're nervous to report it to their contracting officers in charge of CUI and CTI because they don't want to then get shut down or find a lot of work because they need to spend time and effort fixing the problem and, and seeing what happens. So I think a better disclosure system um, that is promotes good practices, again, not just consequences, is, is critical there. And then, uh, not sure how many minutes I have left, but take one, one more. Okay. <laughs> so then just in the products and systems, as we have more and more connected devices that are being developed, um, especially in what I would strongly advocate is a good Silicon Valley DoD partnership where the experts in Silicon Valley are developing technologies that should then be able to be used by DoD potentially separately from uh, public sector use, or private sector use rather, excuse me. Um, is when we talk about Internet of Things and autonomous vehicles, especially going into military deployment, those are moving at lightning speed in a really good way, but there are not only technical security problems that we need to be aware of, with autonomous vehicles such as, well, we don't need to talk about GPS trackers and certain fitness apps that troops are wearing, but in autonomous vehicles, who's tracking the movement of the troops, who's tracking um, the vehicles, those are significant issues that we're all aware of that need to get worked on, but there are just as many offline attacks that need to be incentivized to avoid. For example, one of the more recent attacks that researchers came up with for autonomous vehicles is by putting pieces of tape on a stop sign, they could trick a self-driving vehicle into thinking it was a 45 mile an hour sign instead of a stop sign. So something simple like that just needs to get into the development process so that we're not creating bigger problems. Thanks, Megan. Um, so I just want to start with a few sort of basic concepts and then talk a little bit about offense, a little about defense, and the combination of offense and defense. Um, and one is, the reality that today we are in a very real shooting war in cyberspace. It may not be big bullets, may not be big bombs, may not be nuclear weapons, but we are in an ongoing offensive campaign brought by our enemies against us, right? Whether that's China on IP theft, whether that's Russia on sort of the low level, um, uh, you know, ransomware attacks or the like, 
uh, whether it's Russia against our electoral system. We are very much in a state of cyber conflict today, and it may be something more akin to a Cold War, but it's happening, and it's happening in real time to us. And uh, so you look at things like the now, now publicly described attributions to Iran for the, uh, the efforts against the Las Vegas Sands Corporation, North Korea against Sony, uh, Russia again in the NotPetya attacks, WannaCry to North Korea, um, and now Russia against the Olympics. The U.S. government has now publicly attributed all those attacks to nation-state actors. And so the reality is it's happening. It's not just happening to the government. It's happening to our private sector. And it's not just happening to our private sector. It's happening to our allies. And so uh, the question for us is what, if anything, are we going to do about it? Because to date, we've talked a lot about sanctions. We have an executive order. We've talked about a whole of government approach. That's all fine and great, but the reality is we're not doing a whole hell of a lot, or if we are, it's not very effective because it's not deterring nation-state actors from acting against us or our companies. And so uh, sort of three ideas, uh, one on the offensive side, one on the defensive side, and, and one on the combination of the two. On the offensive side, we've got to have clear rules of engagement. Right? I think that what Khan has raised are really important issues about uh, the tactical need for describing how and when we carry out these attacks. But without clear ROE, right, we're never going to get there. We've been talking about offensive use of cyber since 2007 when I started at the Justice Department. The reality is we have not made effective enough gains going forward. We now have a whole separate cyber command. We now have a capability uh, that's now somewhat publicly described. Uh, but we don't effectively have a method for carrying it out. And we need to have that conversation as a nation and within the DOD and outside of the DOD and with Congress about how to do that. And I think it's incumbent upon Congress to press uh, the administration, as you have already in the last NDA. There were a lot of good provisions on getting more information out of Congress, getting a strategy out of the government. Uh, but now on the ROE question about how effectively do you intend to carry these out. On the defensive side, I think we've talked for a long time about information sharing and how much that needs to happen. <laughs> But the reality is there's a reason why information sharing doesn't happen effectively. One, we still need to do better on the rules uh, that we put in place. CISA was a good first step in 2015. We need to do more on liability. We need to do more on regulatory protection for companies to effectively share. But beyond that, right, we need to show industry the value proposition. So we want you to give us all this information about what you're seeing on your, on your networks because we don't see 98% of the, of the global internet, right? And we'd like to see that to have a better common operating picture. But what are you going to get for that? And we've always talked about, well, you know, we might be able to give you better information if you share but what does that mean tactically? I think Claude was right to raise that question of tactics. And I think what that means for companies is we need to be willing to turn our signals intelligence collection capabilities against the enemies that are coming against our corporate sector and be willing to share that information back with industry to better defend themselves, right? Today, the reality is that we ask Target to defend itself not just against script kiddies and, and criminal gangs, but against nation states. And the reality is that's not a fair game. There's no way in the world Target or Walmart are going to effectively be able to do that. So the government, if it's not going to do it itself, which I don't think anybody's prepared for today, nor should we, right? If the government's not going to do that, we've got to be able to empower industry, and that's got to come at, a, at sort of an exchange for information, right? You tell us what you're seeing, we'll use our capabilities to empower you to defend yourself. Um, and then third, I guess what I would say is that combination of offensive and defense. What that means is that, you know, the reality is that one day, even though I've made the argument that the balloon is already going up on cyber, right, one day the balloon is really going to go up, and we're going to face a no-holds-barred cyber war as part of, likely as part of a larger campaign when we get into a larger conflict. And the question is, what do we do then? And how do industry and government work together when that, on, that day that, on the day that happens? And today, we have limited protocols in place for how to operate in cyberspace. We can't even share information effectively. The idea is somehow that we'd be able to effectively operate in an actual no BS cyber war is a joke. And that's embarrassing given that we are long past Georgia, we are long past Estonia, we're long past Ukraine, and yet we have no real ability to figure out how to make industry and government come together. And I realize there are challenges in trust coming out of snow disclosures, but the day the balloon goes up and we're not prepared for that is the day that the American people are gonna call both industry and the government to the carpet and say, what were you thinking? Not being ready when you saw this, this crisis coming at you. So that's what I've got. Great. Um, well, I think these are all really great and interesting ideas. The one that I'm going to focus on is the thing that underlies all of this. If we want to do any of these things, we need the people, and the government is not getting the people in cyberspace to be able to do this work effectively. Um, frankly, I'd love to see a GAO report or something on this to prove this, but I think even without that information, it's pretty clear that when you post cybersecurity jobs, they stay open way too long, and the quality of applicants that you get is way down from what you need. 
and I'm coming to you from UC Berkeley and I know exactly where the people are. They're all over with me, they're at Stanford, they're hanging out in Silicon Valley at Google and Facebook, and admittedly, even there, they struggle to keep uh, folks in place. But there is a huge sector of the population who could bring the exact skills they need to accomplish none of these problems, and we're not getting those folks. And why is that? Um, I think there's a couple reasons. One is pure geography. Uh, most folks at Berkeley are never exposed to anything related to government, uh, so they're not thinking about that as a possible career path. Uh, but there's also uh, <coughs> cultural issues, let's call it, uh, bureaucratic issues. Um, we have a culture in the valley of creativity, of breaking things, of not wearing suits, uh, and hence not no suit. Um, and when you ask people to entirely shift not only their location, but the way that they do things and the creativity that they uh, engage in, you're going to get some pushback and you might not get the right type of person. So the specific idea that I propose to you here is a cyber workforce incubator. Let's build something in which you can solve classified problems out on the West Coast or in another location outside the Beltway in which we can bring talented people side by side with government employees to think about the future. So how would this work? Basically, you need to build a skiff somewhere outside the Beltway where there are pockets of these really talented people. Then you need to second government employees for one to two years working side by side with industry folks that are also seconded from their companies for one to two years. By the way, I know lots of industry folks that would be very happy to have their folks get on tools that they couldn't use in the private sector otherwise in exchange for the opportunity to second their people for a little bit of time. And you have them work side by side. You need some faster security clearances. You don't need all that much else. But you actually give these folks the opportunity to exchange to build an alumni network and that there are people who have actually experienced government and can go back to Google and Facebook and say, oh my god, these folks are really great at their jobs, they're very cool, we should work more closely with them. You start to tick away at some of these challenges. Um, it seems like low hanging fruit to me, so uh, very happy to talk to you about it. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to ask some questions for a few minutes, but then I will open it up to questions. So start start developing a few. I'll try to keep mine to 15 minutes max to, to leave some time for y'all. Um, I'm just going to ask you about a few of your proposals because some of them, every person had some really, really fascinating ideas. Um, Tara, can you speak a moment longer for anyone who doesn't know the Kaspersky Lab issues? And can you speak to whether or not, do you expect this to happen again? Is it already happening again? And can you just talk a little bit more about what DOD should really, really do to make sure that this is not an issue? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so the Kaspersky Labs issue, for those of you who aren't aware, is that there, there are a number of different antivirus software providers, which nowadays is woefully insufficient as a secondary tool, but it's a necessary uh, uh, arrow to have in your quiver. And most of the providers are US-based companies that have been around for a really long time, the McAfee, Symantec, et cetera. Uh, but one is called Kaspersky, and it's based out of Russia. And uh, it, it is an antivirus tool that has been used throughout the government, writ large, and in lots of private sector companies. At it has always been surprising to me, based on nothing official other than uh, it, it, Kaspersky issued a report uh, maybe five years ago mm -hmm. saying that they discovered a treasure trove of nine billion username, account, and passwords. And that sort of put them on the map in terms of our consciousness here, but it was a completely over-exaggerated media stunt. It was nine billion usernames and passwords. but something like two-thirds of them were the same person, same password. Most of them were expired, or they were encrypted passwords, so you couldn't even use them to log in. So the company has been somewhat um, disingenuous, great, great word. So anyway, it's, but it has been used as a primary antivirus software in a lot of the government, and it is suspected widely as being either run by uh, Russian intelligence or at least being an open door for Russian intelligence. Uh, Kaspersky himself certainly denies this and is now appealing um, to court here to say it was unfair that he was, his software was taken out of U.S. government systems. But I, I mean, I think that it's, I have no idea how it happened. I wish I had some kind of idea. It's, it, and, I'm, and I'm not always a, have to be a U.S. product first person, but in this particular case, when we're talking about cybersecurity, uh, you know, 
maybe like just some slightly more friendly in terms of is it happening again? I really hope not. I, I, I mean, I'm not aware of. I mean, that was that was sort of a well-known thing. You know, it wasn't it, it wasn't surprising to many of us when this came out that it was a potential issue. So I'm hopeful that that there's something else going on. Yeah. I mean, you do have Huawei and ZTE, Huawei and the British Telecom Network, uh, right? Obviously, a concern for folks. Uh, Huawei working with, with the National Cybersecurity Center in Britain. So I think there are concerns. We've successfully pushed back on Huawei and ZTE here in the United States and with some of our allies. It hasn't worked in England, though. And so that is another challenge, I think, because there are significant concerns. The House and Bill Committee put out a report in 2012 on, on the potential uh, use of Huawei and ZTE as, as vehicles for Chinese espionage. And that's a great example because there are some government processes that require a particular license for Huawei to operate here in DTE, et cetera. So it may, I mean, that's, maybe that's something that could happen in, in the cyber world to limit that exposure. Uh, I'm just going to, one of the implications of this as you guys think about pursuing NDAA this year, <clears throat> Kaspersky as, a, as an <clears throat> antivirus software capability was actually pretty capable. And it was in part capable because it had what's called root or kernel access, meaning it essentially had the keys of the kingdom of whatever computer it was monitoring. Um, and the question that this begs is, is how could the United States government, and particularly the Department of Defense, ever allow a foreign created capability like that to exist on U.S. systems? And so that starts tumbling into some pretty difficult conversations about, well, are we heading, at least in, in regards to national security issues and product acquisition and um, pipelines, are we, are we heading toward a new mercantilism where, where something is made, who it's made by, where it's produced, where it resides, is definitive as regards to our ability to use it or not use it. And I think recognizing that reality is not the same as, as advocating for it, but when it comes to DOD and, it, and it's thinking about its... Um, it's acquisition pipelines. I mean, that, that's a major issue. And I'm more pessimistic, uh, just by nature. Um, but then uh, I suspect this will absolutely happen again. I suspect that we'll look at major weapons acquisition systems and be very concerned uh, at what we find. Well, and, and in part because, you know, even if you look at your Apple iPhone, which is an American made product by an American made company, right? It's manufactured in China, right? And you look at the chips that come from it, and those chips are, fa are made at foundries that are not in the United States. And we no longer have a, a, a chip foundry in the United States that actually makes the core chips. And if you're on that part of the project, as we saw with the recent uh, disclosures about the, these two sort of problems on chip uh, issues, um, it's a really hard problem to solve. And you still have a phone. Right. <laughs> and, and, and I got my iPhone right here, right? I mean, I didn't buy Huawei or ZTE, but, you know. Um, my Foxconn <laughs> iPhone. Um, um, Jamil, you were talking about the need for broader initiatives to strengthen cybersecurity. <coughs> but at the signing of last year's NDAA, Trump, or, uh, the president actually expressed that he thought Congress was usurping his authority when they, when, uh, they wanted to create a cyber strategy report, when they wanted to create a cyber deterrence report. Do you see some of your proposals as being contrary to what the administration wants? And even if it did, should Congress do it anyway? Yeah, I mean, look, I think that there is, there are a couple challenges here, right? One is that there's always this tension between Congress and the administration about telling me what to do when it comes to my commander in chief powers, right? And so the president will always write a signing statement that says, you can't tell me to do these things, but I'm gonna go along with it because, you know, I wanna make the deal and whatever. Um, but, but you know, it, particularly when it comes to some of these more edgy things like how we deal with Russian cyber interference, the reality is that there is a tension between Congress and the administration on these issues, and it's incumbent upon Congress to sort of play that string out and, and play the bad cop, right? And, you know, if you're going to conduct effective oversight, right, effective oversight means not just identifying the problems, but saying to the administration, you've got to solve them, and if you're not going to solve them, we're going to help you solve them. Um, and we're going to get more and more aggressive until you do. And, you know, there's always that sort of creative challenge. Um, but I've always been an advocate for when I've been on the congressional side. And I've heard Congress doing more in this space than I've been on the executive side. Said, no, 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 you guys just go do your thing. Let us know. We'll have some hearings. be great. We don't want anything in the bill. So, you know, it's all about you sort of stand where you sit, right? So, yeah. Klan, your discussion of authorities that people need on the ground um, 
really interesting, really concerning for our soldiers. What, what are the repercussions if these authorities do not exist? Yeah, so as I mentioned briefly, the, the, the implications of not addressing this is that um, we have men and women who were tasking with the completion of mission sets that are core to their, to their, uh, to their units. And there is increasingly, uh, as the world becomes more wired, there's an increasing uh, cyber aspect to that capability. Um, so, uh, you know, you can think back to operations that have happened in, in portions of Africa, and let's say someone's being kidnapped and they're being held. Well, the likelihood of um, mobile devices or technical surveillance capabilities and all that kind of thing existing and being used by the bad guys is almost guaranteed now, even in austere environments. Uh, and so the ability to engage, if necessary, disrupt, manipulate, even just gather intelligence, um, that's just a core mission component now. It's, it's, it's right up, it's the digital equivalent of being able to pull a trigger and put, you know, iron on target. Um, and when they don't have the authority to do that, as they currently do not, they have to assume a significantly higher risk to personnel and to mission accomplishment. And, I mean, just to put an exclamation point on it, that feels almost immoral to send them out to do that, but then not enable them in what I would call a fundamental way. Now, I think there should be constraints on that, right? I think there should be um, a significant review process. I'm not advocating for kind of broader uh, military application of this capability. I think that's a much too higher high lift. But I am talking about taking the types of authorities that certain national level assets enjoy, and broadening them to the, uh, the broader so-called white special operations forces, because they're often accomplishing those missions. And, and to be very clear, we're talking about render safe missions in WMD. I mean, the Canadian, uh, just as an example, Canadian special forces were, uh, uh, regular special forces were, were tasked with uh, securing uh, mustard gas uh, not too long ago. And there was a digital security component to that prospect. And um, these, these aren't kind of, they're increasingly not peculiar mission sets, they're, they're increasingly bread and butter mission sets. And uh, I think that requirement or that authority is, is essential. Why hasn't this happened already? Is this, is this an argument between these larger agencies or do people just not really recognize that problem? No, it's, it's just crazy hard. I, 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 I don't, I don't, um, I, don't be, I don't begrudge or dismiss anyone's intentions in this. I, I mean, the governing, the governing realities that have, have, have been in effect up to this point is like, wait a minute, if you're operating in some foreign land and you take an offensive oper cyber operation and you break something, oh my gosh, that could have major catastrophic consequences. That's absolutely true. That, I, I can't deny that. That's absolutely true. But that's also why I describe the context as being these kind of limited in a hostile environment with temporary effects, so not intentionally trying to break something. And the reality is, is that a misplaced round can have the same strategic impact. And we allow these individuals to go out and we entrust them with responsibility. They've proven themselves to be uh, responsible enough to execute those missions. And I think that this is just an, an extension of that reality and not something wholly different. Um, and then last, Dr. Cooper. Uh, about your cyber workforce, which your incubator proposal, which is incredibly interesting. Um, with this, so we we get we get into conversations with DoD, and most people say you should definitely increase the workforce, absolutely necessary. But then you'll get a few naysayers who seem to think that all training folks at DoD to learn to do cyber security better is that it will create a cyber drain that all these smart folks are just going to leave for the valley as soon as as soon as they develop these new skills um, do you see that happening and does your does your proposal kind of prevent that or allow it to happen more naturally in a way that you always have the influx of people coming in right um, so that is always a concern um, First point would be, even if that is true, still better to have them trained, right? I don't think it's a good answer to say, let's not train people because we're afraid they'll leave government. That's why we're behind, if that's the attitude that we're getting. But I've heard those concerns as well. 
Um, the incubator proposal precisely does the secundi model in order to mitigate against that. So you come in for one to two years, then you go back to your original job. Now, will there be some risk that people get out to California and say, oh, maybe I don't want to go back? Yes, of course. The weather's great. The weather's great. Actually, it's warmer it here. It's a lot more. It's warmer here today than there. Don't worry about it. Uh, but I, I do think that if that's true, then we don't have to have all of government operations here either. If it's true that we would do better at cyber operations by having outposts out in California, then build it. You already have DIUX, the Defense Innovation <laughs> Unit, out there. You could expand that. There's already space out there, you know, on the on the base. So, you know, I don't think it's an either-or situation. I think the key is we want the best people working on the tough government problems that these folks are talking about, and with the current system, we're not going to get that. Yeah, and for you and for everyone else, um, <laughs> I have a Silicon Valley connection, and I know most people at this table probably do as well. Do you have any additional ideas on how Congress could support a DOD Silicon Valley connection? Because it's absolutely necessary. I mean, certainly expanding the role of DIUX. Um, DIUX has done some great things on the procurement side, uh, but they haven't been as broadly focused on other engagement aspects. And so I think expanding that role and giving them the remit, giving them the money, frankly, to be able to do um, those sorts of operations would be really important. Um, I'd also say that, you know, there's a lot of uh, advisory boards, you know, Eric Schmidt does this innovation board, there's, you know, advisors to the NSA, et cetera, from Silicon Valley. Let's open that up. Let's create more opportunities for engagement that aren't just, you know, the occasional FACA, like, come in and, you know, you give two minutes of talks and then people go back into the closed doors. Let's do more regular engagements. Let's have government people come out and talk to Facebook and Google on a more regular basis. It's the relationship building, and uh, we're not seeing enough of it. And not just the government affairs people, but the right. actual engineers. Exactly. Who are hard to talk to, but definitely worth it. <laughs> but they talk, to, they talk to each other. I mean, we can step aside and let them have at it. You know? <laughs> No, I think this is. I think this is actually a great. This this uh, this cyber workforce incubator is a great a great concept because you know we've been talking a lot about how to expand the workforce, how to expand getting folks in the valley integrated into into the government and vice versa. We've never really had a concrete way to do it. So I really like I really like the concept, um, and I like the idea of sort of pairing it up with DIUS and the, the existing facilities and concepts out there. Um, you know, we have skiff space out there, so there's an opportunity right there to use that. Uh, use that space there. So I think at the end of the day, you've got to have a practical value for industry to really engage, whether it's the engineers and the value they see by exchanging information with the government um, or or sort of, you know, this idea that I've talked about about sharing information. At the end of the day, there has to be some there there. And the problem is the government seems to have, have we, we seem to have this impression in the government that we know so much more that we don't really need to give you value. As long as we like let you in, you know, you should be happy with that. And the reality is, that's not the way the Valley sees it, and they're right. So we need to sort of rethink the way we think about these things and recognize that we don't have all the answers here in Washington, D.C. There are a lot of good answers out there. Uh, we've got to rebuild that bridge that's, that's largely, that we largely lost in 2013, 2014. Can, can I just add to that quickly? Uh, so I think there's actually two false, pre um, two false uh, perceptions that need to be, to be fixed. Uh, on the government side, I think there needs to be a recognition and a realization that we are, I say we, um, the, the federal government needs to understand that it is, it is now a, a stakeholder, not the stakeholder, on law enforcement and national security issues. I mean, the reality is, is in terms of personnel, in terms of capability, in terms of information, that is migrating to the private sector. And in the same way that the tech market has these winner-take-all markets, that that Strategic advantage is only going to continue to grow exponentially, and the government simply isn't going to catch up. It's just not. It doesn't have the capacity. Uh, and so there needs to be a recognition, and a, frankly, a humility on the federal government side, that it is a stakeholder. And so as it walks into conversations like Jamil was mentioning, um, yeah, everyone's not just privileged to be in the same room with you because you're from Washington. That just that doesn't work anymore. Um, on the opposite side, on the opposite side, though, industry cannot continue to do the Snowden Heisman to government. Um, and there needs to be an understanding that they're actually over the same barrel. That, that many of the national security challenges and the law enforcement challenges that the federal government is trying to engage effectively are things that are going to continually constrain them, even if it's just from a purely pragmatic business model. Case in point, 2016 elections, both parties could have done a much better job engaging with one another. But the reality is, 
is that the federal government is left with real bruises to the legitimacy of our democracy. And industry is left with the high level risk of a regulatory regime that's going to hurt them. And so the reality is, is that both of these uh, parties need to have an evolution in their perception of one another and of, of themselves. Um, and I'm frankly not particularly <laughs> playing to type here in terms of my pessimism. Um, I'm not super motivated to think that either one of them is going to kind of make the first move. And so where I'm landing is I think civil society groups, NGOs, think tanks, things like that, actually have an opportunity to play a key bridging role uh, by hopefully developing a reputation as a trusted agent with legitimate knowledge and, when necessary, act as, a, um, as an appropriate degree of separation between the two organizations as they try to communicate. Uh, that's certainly something we're going to be trying to do uh, where I am, uh, and I think all of us would, would generally agree that that's a good approach. Okay, opening up to questions. We have 15 minutes, so there's plenty of time. Go for it. Uh, Mike Nelson with Cloudflare. We're a web security company in the Valley, yeah, San Francisco. Um, when you have these discussions, you always hear information sharing and standards. <laughs> And we had some discussion of information sharing. We haven't talked much about standards. And I'd be interested to hear the panel's thoughts on how we can make sure the standards don't actually keep us three or five years behind. Uh, we have FedRAMP, which is very difficult for new breakthrough technologies to qualify for. We have proposals here on the Hill to impose a bunch of procurement regulations on IoT devices, which is great if it's a pacemaker and or a tank, but in some cases these regulations would add a ten dollars of cost to a twenty cent sensor. So, any thoughts on how we can design sensors, the standards that would actually allow us to take the latest and greatest technology, rather than technology that's three or four years old, and any models you would point to, either in the U.S. or elsewhere, where cybersecurity standards have really worked? Awesome. Um, I I think it's a great point. I I disagree with the premise that the standards keep us three to five years behind. I think probably in procurement contracting processes they do. But this, so for example, NIST 853 has been around since what feels like the dawn of time. It's a 469 page document that goes through all of the things you should consider when building a secure product service program, etc. But it is not very descriptive. So the 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 people who follow it the way it was intended to be followed can certainly use it for new technology because they, they should be able to you know, implement one mitigation tactic here and then back off on a couple others because this one compensates for the others. So I, I'm not sure if I may be missing something in the question about that piece of it, but in terms of what I've seen work well is the fact that companies can choose their own standards to build against. So like the cloud, the CSS controls. Sorry, the cloud security model, and then the CIS top 20 controls. I think picking those or um, NIST, either the cybersecurity framework or the more technical 853, I have seen it work well for companies that are security minded. I think um, if a company is generally good at security, then these help. If a company is not good at security, they're not incredibly helpful in, in bringing them along. Yeah, I think, I think standards are useful. I think regulations are where the disaster comes into place. I think that's what really holds us back three to five years, right? Because the idea somehow that our federal government, which is catastrophically bad at its own cybersecurity, is going to tell industry how to fix its, and make its cybersecurity better is moronic, right? Uh, and the cost being imposed by the FTC, which, uh, which is using its, its, uh, its fair, unfair trade practices uh, authorities, to go out and sort of enforce what its view of cybersecurity is, it's just not working well. And so I think where uh, where there's an opportunity here, I think what you have seen is the NIST standards do work, right? They do encourage companies to uh, to do better. They do give them sort of a guidance on how they can do that uh, without imposing it uh, directly. Um, but there are a lot of back though. I mean, the NIST framework has worked because it says solve this problem, solve this problem, solve this problem. Right. It doesn't say. Buy this product. No, that's, that's, really, product. That's, exactly, that's exactly what I mean, right? So that kind of framework is exactly the right place to go. I think the wrong place to go is to say, here's something you have to buy. Here's a method you need to utilize to protect yourself. Because the reality is, A, you're not good at that. Even if they were good at that, 
by the time the ink is dry on the paper, it's gonna be out of date, right? Yes. And so you're gonna be building to a standard that doesn't make any sense, right? And you're thinking, well, I've met my regulatory burden, I've, I've, I've got this compliance-minded culture that works, but the security is a failure, right? And so the idea somehow that the government can effectively move and regulate, whether it's through laws or regulations, even though regulations are less sticky, they're still sticky and they're not good. It's the idea somehow that that's the solution and not the problem. And, and I, would, I guess what I've cautioned uh, folks against is, our tendency, you know, as, as folks who've worked in the government for a long time, is, well, if there's a problem, we can help fix it, right? This is an area where actually you can help fix it, but it's by bringing industry and government together, right? Identifying the problem and finding out the, government, the industry's best solutions, not by saying you've got this solution to the problem, go do that. And I guess I'd add one thing to that. So on occasion, there may be times when either for other reasons or for practical reasons, you have to put in some sort of regulation that actually has that. If you're going to put that in, then there needs to be a peer review process or something built in so that it can change over time. Yeah. Um, so this is what we do in our situations. We're building all sorts of products for you know, how to protect vulnerable groups online, you know, toolkits and stuff. And the first thing we do is gather a bunch of smart people and get them to commit to sit with us every six months to make sure that the recommendation that we put in today, multi-factor authentication, is the recommendation that's still good six months from now. Um, you know, you can see with the antivirus software story, right? Uh, everybody would have said it's better to have any antivirus software on your computer uh, rather than none, right? So, because first year nothing, go for it. And now I think that recommendation would change. Um, so we need to be in a place where we can change what we're thinking over time. And I don't think government has gotten creative enough about how to build in these sorts of peer review processes. Um, yes. You would absolutely expect complacency if you have regulations without additional... Um, right, and it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, yes. that's right. That's okay. right. Next, next question. Uh, so, Khan, speaking to your, you know, looking closely at NDAA for FY19 and the authorities piece, because I do think that's something that might come up, but how do you deal with the, the deconfliction problem as you start to push things down? Because it's one thing, I mean, I think you're still underselling some of the collateral damage piece some. Um, but even setting that aside, how do you deal with the deconfliction, whether it's because you're losing capabilities, infrastructure, or someone else is on the network that you just turned off? Uh, yep, it's hard. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a big, naughty mess. And, and I don't have the solution, per se. Of course, as an expert, I don't have to have solutions. I just tell you the problems. But the, the reality is, is that we do all kinds of super complex, really important deconfliction all up and down the chain. In, in DOD. So whether it's choosing where we're going to put a bomb on target and, and what the collateral damage is going to be and doing the BDA afterwards and everything else, we have this capacity and I think that we could leverage that in this category as well. Now, the big problem with this one is, is with most of that decision chain, with, with, with non-cyber issues, is being able to trace out the secondary and tertiary implications and, and even the unintended consequences is much easier. On the net, you can break something over here and something radically bad goes over there. But that's also why I framed the discussion particularly as I did in terms of local, temporary, and in a conflict zone. I think it could go beyond that. But what about, I mean, just in terms of the capabilities and infrastructure, you know, to some extent if I drop a bomb or I, I send a drone in and there's a strike, right, UAS strike, I've given my adversary some knowledge that I have a UAS capability that's sure. around. But they probably know that already, unlike a cyber capability where my, you know, the infrastructure that I'm shooting off of or whatever the capability that gave me access, even if it is a closed network, if, if the network survives at all and anyone can go back and do forensics, it's like, oh, here's this tool, and now maybe I can't use it somewhere else. Yeah, but we've had this, look, we've had, so there's, I think there's two things you're raising, right? One is the, the, the capability to deliver, the, the delivery mechanism, right? The intel access that we use to deliver the weapon, right? And then the weapon itself, the capability to blow something up, right? And I think there's two different problems, right? We've always dealt with intel gain loss questions, right? When you sacrifice a given a given capability, right, to to take action, that happens all the time. When you use at a covert, the tactical level, I mean, that's yeah, sure, the sure, level. when you use, if you use a covert action asset, right, to conduct an operation, right, that, that will come at some cost. Now, it's true that that's more prevalent in cyberspace, but this is not, we, we have this sort of fetish about cyberspace that it's, everything's all new and different in cyberspace. The reality is we've dealt with these problems before and we have mechanisms for dealing with this, right? I actually, I actually think the dual hatting, this is actually one place where the dual hatting actually makes a lot of sense. Because yeah. at the end of the day, you have one human being who knows about the intel access, 
knows about the cape, the side, the offensive capability, and can make a decision. Now, but the challenge is that's right, not that's not at no, no, no. But at, but the tactical level that, that that plays out down the down the road too, right? Play, you can play that all the way down to the lowest level, right? The challenge is at the end of the day, you've got to find a way of delivering capability in the space. You cannot continue to fight. We cannot expect our operators to fight with one hand tied behind their back. Nor can we have, and this goes back to the larger question of having the lawyers in the room on every, on every decision, right? We fight wars the most ridiculous way possible today, and I say this as a recovering lawyer, right? We, we put our lawyers in every conversation, every time, <coughs> and at the most tactical, grass level. It is an idiotic way to fight a war, right? Yes, it's important to, keep, to, to, to estimate collateral damage and to figure that out, but at the end of the day, you, you cannot continue to hamper our ability to act in cyberspace the way we have across the board in other areas. You've got to find some flexibility here, and clear rules of engagement give you the opportunity to do that, I think. Well, and, and just, I, I think very practically, as, as I you know, talk to my friends in the community, one of the things they say is that if you're looking in terms of the method of gaining access, particularly in these conflict zones, these aren't like regularly patched capabilities, right? I mean, like most of the things that would actually give us access, the the, the portion of the threat surface that we would exploit to the, deliver a payload um, is something that's probably been announced, already known, and has been patched. It just hasn't been actually done on that particular system. And so, in terms of the intel gain loss, I think that's actually a pretty easy one. Now, in terms of the uh, in terms of the payload delivery, and what we're actually doing once we gain access, um, there is a risk if you've got some really sweet you know tool that you're using. You're going to have to be really smart about that. But again, in the categories of, of operations that I'm talking about, you're yeah, you're not using those tools because honestly, those are at the national level. Yeah. And the stuff that's happening down at the tactical level, it's all hammers and Lots saws. I mean, and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's already it crowbars. It's 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 not particularly sophisticated. So I don't want to deny the tension that you're articulating. I I understand that it's real, but I do think it's a workable challenge. And, and one last thing on that, you know, deterrence only works when you talk about some of your capabilities, right? Part of the, another cyberspace fetish is we can never talk about our capabilities at all, ever, because they came out of the intel community, so we can never talk about it. The reality is, it's no surprise you can't deter when you're not showing your weapons off. We've got to show some, I'm not saying you've got to show all your capabilities, but you've got to show some capability if you're going to have effective deterrence, in part. And there's a lot of other reasons why deterrence doesn't work in cyberspace, but that's one of them, right? We don't talk about capabilities. Question for Betsy, just caveating on your incubator status or uh, opportunity there. You know, Incutel as well, who's put an mm -hmm. office up in Boston yep. to try and work with MIT and all of that. I think they've gone on a good incubator set. They have the office in, in Menlo Park there as well. Okay. Um, caveating on that though, we look at, I've been back and forth between private and public sector for years. Uh, we have seen help build some of the tools that we, we use currently. But what we see is the, the compensation. How do we fix that compensation gap? Because I'm going to make double or triple the money working for Facebook or Google that I can in a GS-15 or 12 in the government. Totally. Um, so two great points. Um, first, Incutel, actually, we use that in this paper as a good model. Um, one of the things I like about it, actually, is it's not on the base because it gets you really in Men You know, you're in Menlo Park, right where I used to live. You're in the middle of the city, so to speak. It's a pretty lame city, but nevertheless, uh, you get to hang out uh, and really be in the valley rather than somewhere else. Um, and they've also set up the authorities in quite a clever way so that they have a lot of flexibility to bring folks in. Now, I don't know exactly how the compensation works, but I do know they steal people from venture capital pretty regularly, which means that they've figured out some of those systems. Um, in this paper for compensation, we propose that uh, industry and government likely would share some of that responsibility so that industry would continue to pay some portion of the salary, which could help mitigate the problem. Um, it doesn't help solve the problem because at the end of the day, nevertheless, you're never going to be up at the same level. But people do care about public interest mission, and that's particularly true in light of a lot of guilt in Silicon Valley around not catching what was going on with Russia in the election. So there are a lot of personal reasons why people might be willing to make this leap if you bring it closer. You definitely still have to bring it closer, but I don't think it needs to be equal for people to still be incented to want to participate in a program like this. One last question. I just have a very basic workforce question. You have all these talented people that are, for lack of a better term, grown-ups and they're already in the industry. What's being done to get kids, high school kids, and college students mm -hmm. to be attracted to the industry? 
Yeah, so I mean, that is definitely another area not the focus today, but certainly the entire pipeline needs to be improved. Um, there's a lot of uh, smaller pieces. I know that NIST, for instance, has an office on cybersecurity education. At DOD, I, you know, there's obviously uh, grand cyber challenges and things where they bring students in to try to compete on cybersecurity issues. Um, certainly, you know, there's a couple things that DOD could do, investing more in research, investing more in these opportunities uh, all the way through the pipeline, and frankly, diversifying the workforce as well. One of the key problems why kids don't get interested in this space is they assume it's just a hacker with a hoodie who only plays on his computer and plays video games in his spare time when he's not coding. That's not the reality of the workforce, but it, the stereotype still lives. And until we start investing and in trying to say we're not going to be satisfied with that, it's going to be a narrow slice that gets into this, and we're not doing enough to improve that. And I'll, I'll just piggyback on that. I know that at campuses across the US, there are cyber programs being developed that aren't necessarily just coders. They're also policy heads, lawyers. Uh, there, there are a bunch of different groups that are suddenly springing up because there is a recognition that not you're not always getting kids interested in public service who are also interested in cyber. And so there is a groundswell in this movement right now. Um, let's see. Final thoughts, two minutes, if anyone has them. Awesome. Um, I'd just say that you know we both have this paper and some draft legislation, so if anybody's interested, we'd love to talk to you more. And more broadly, love to have a conversation about bringing peer review into different standards uh, conversations. And so anything that we can do to help, uh, we're not really the traditional university organization we want to engage. So please, uh, let us engage. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I've got nothing to add. <laughs>